the starting point of our book is the observation that although machine learning has been around for a long time, we are now starting to use it for increasingly consequential tasks, as many people here at Google will know. So for example, um, as was in the news recently, lending decisions, like if you apply for an Apple credit card, will you get a high credit limit or a low credit limit, are now often made without any human intervention at all, just, just an algorithm. Uh, HR departments make hiring and, and uh, compensation decisions use, informed by machine learning algorithms. And in a number of states, including in Pennsylvania, uh, bail and parole decisions are informed by, by trained models. And so it's sort of natural when you start making, when you start using machine learning to make important decisions about people, that you start worrying that maybe those algorithms will violate some of the social norms that we would expect of human decision makers when they were making those decisions. And indeed, like, there's lots of evidence that this happens. We, we see news articles every week, and there's a number of uh, very good popular books that have pointed out the problem. And, and here's three books here that we admire. But what these books do is very much point out the problem, but, but where they say less is about what you can do to fix these problems, right? what the solutions are. They, they talk about the need for regulation, for example, which we by and large agree with, but uh, they don't talk about technically what you would do to make the algorithms better behaved. And that's the goal of our book, to explain in, in plain English the emerging science um, of, of what we talk about as embedding ethical norms into algorithms. And there's now a community of hundreds of people, including us, working on these problems. One comment we, we often get, in fact, something that one of our early reviewers asked us is, does the very premise of the book, like the title of the book, does it make any sense, the ethical algorithm? Because algorithms are, in the end, tools. They're human artifacts, like hammers. And well, algorithms like hammers can be used to do bad things. They can be used as instruments of violence. I could whack you on the hand with a hammer. But if I did that, we wouldn't think of this as some moral failing of the hammer, right? Like you would attribute that action directly to me. Um, and that's basically how we regulate, um, you know, and, and write laws about, about violence, um, you know, uh, induced by hammers, right? We say if I whack you on the hand with a hammer, then I'm very likely going to have to go to jail, and I'll take that into account when I'm deciding whether I want to do that. But algorithms, and when we, when we say algorithms, we really mean models, the, the sort of trained models that are the output of the machine learning pipeline are different. Um, they're different in a number of ways, but, but one that's salient for this discussion is that it's very difficult to predict the outcome in every situation of, a, of a, an algorithm that you've trained using the principles of machine learning. Okay, so, so many of you are aware of what the machine learning pipeline looks like, but let's just briefly recount it. You know, you'll start with some data set. Okay, a data set might these days consist of records of millions of people. You might have hundreds of thousands of features for each person. And in the best case, right, if you're lucky, you're in the best case. You're not always in the best case. In the best case, you understand this data set as the data scientist you know, developing an algorithm in the sense that maybe you know how the data was gathered, maybe you know what all of the features represent. Okay? But it's hard to say that you really understand all of the information contained in such a massive object. And then you use this data set to formulate some usually narrow objective function, some proxy for classification error or maybe profit, and you use some tool, something like stochastic gradient descent, to search over some enormous class of models to find the one that is best or you know, very good at maximizing your narrow objective function. And then you get out some, some model. Right? If, you're, if you're training a, a deep neural network, this might consist of, of millions of parameters. And it's hard to say anything at all about this model, except that it's probably very good as measured according to the objective function you specified. And so the problem is when and if this model goes on to inflict some harm on some person or some group of people, you know, it's, it's typically not the case that this harm was the result of some malintent of the software engineer or scientist who is sitting behind the scenes and, and, and building this algorithm. Right? If that was the case, the situation would be much simpler. Right? Existing regulatory tools could uh, 
be used to weed out bad actors. But the problem is that the harms that we see from algorithms are typically the unanticipated and unintended side effects of, of optimization over large classes of models, of the very basic premise of machine learning. And so if we're going to, if we're going to prevent you know, this, this bad behavior by, by learned algorithms, we need to figure out how to um, embed our social values, the, the actions that we want the algorithms not to exhibit into the design process itself. Okay, and that's, that's hard, right? Because words like privacy and fairness and accountability, these are, you know, big and vague. They mean many things. But um, it's important to be precise about definitions. When, when you say privacy or fairness, and you, in particular when you say you want an algorithm to be private or fair, um, it's not enough to speak about these things as a philosopher might, for example, because just at a very practical level, if you're going to embed these things as constraints into some optimization, you need to be mathematically precise. It's also enlightening to, you know, it's an enlightening exercise even separately from, um, you know, the need to embed mathematical constraints when you're designing algorithms to think about what you really mean, what are different kinds of privacy, what are different kinds of fairness. And the very act of trying to be very precise about these things um, is illuminating and can reveal new trade-offs that, that maybe weren't um, immediately evident. So we've written these words in, deg in decreasing degree of grayscale, uh, starting with privacy, ending with, with morality, and you, know, you can't even see it, but, but you know, Michael assures me he wrote singularity in white at the bottom there. <laughs> in proportion, basically, to how much progress we've made trying to understand these things at a, at a sort of mathematically precise level, how much progress we've made thinking about the consequences of embedding constraints representing these notions into algorithms. So it's not to say that we've solved privacy or, or that we have precise ways of thinking about all of the many different kinds of privacy, but as we'll talk about in a moment, we've made some progress. Fairness isn't there yet, but it's, it's along a good path. And, and for these other things, accountability, interpretability, and you know, even more as you go further down the list, and people are working on these things and, and they're important, but we feel like we don't have the right definitions yet that are, that are sort of a necessary prerequisite to making the kind of scientific progress that we talk about in the book. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Sarah. Okay, so um, what we want to do with most of the remaining time is just, you know, go through two quick vignettes, one on privacy and one on fairness, which, as per Aaron's last slide, are the areas where, that we feel are, in relative terms, the most mature for the type of scientific research or algorithmic research that we're discussing. And as Aaron said, sometimes like the very exercise of having to think so precisely about the definitions of these social norms is itself um, greatly beneficial and might not only reveal trade-offs that you weren't aware of, but like flaws in your intuitions about these ideas if you just talk about them at the level that, let's say, a moral philosopher might. Um, and so privacy is a good case study. Um, we, would, uh, we argue in the book that we feel like there's a definition of privacy for at least of the type of privacy that I'm going to talk about here is the right definition, which is differential privacy. Um, but it's preceded by definitions that I think we and others feel like are fundamentally flawed. And unfortunately, these fundamentally flawed concepts are the ones almost exclusively in force in practice these days. So if you look at a you know, end user license agreement or a privacy policy of a large company, they will no normally refer to policies, if they're, if they're precise at all, they'll talk about um, various forms of anonymization or remove, um, removing PII, personally identifiable information. And to give you a sense of why we think those definitions are fundamentally flawed, I have here a toy example. Um, in which there's two different databases from two different hospitals of medical records. And um, due to privacy concerns, there's been some anonymization done here. And anonymization largely consists of, you know, operations of redaction, like just like entirely removing certain columns from a database, or coarsening in which you sort of fuzz up the information. And then the hope is that somehow when you're done with this, um, you have some sort of uh, pri privacy uh, guarantees. So in this top database, um, you know, somebody's gone in and decided, like, well, let's r entirely redact name. Rather than giving precise ages, let's group them into decades. So, you know, are you 10 to 20, 20 to 30, et cetera? 
let's give some information about zip code but redact the last two digits, and let's keep some of the medical information like whether you're a smoker or not, we'll come back to smoking in a minute, and what you know, the particular diagnosis that you were given um, in your visit was. And of course, in reality, you know, these databases would be much, much larger for a large hospital like the University of Pennsylvania's. There might be tens of thousands of records, but the, the, the conceptual flaw can already be demonstrated in this toy example. Suppose you, know, you have some additional information aside from this database, like you have a neighbor named Rebecca who you happen to know is female and that she's 57 years old, and you know this because she's your neighbor and you're friends with her, okay? So if with that side information you also manage to get hold of this allegedly anonymized database, then already in it there are exactly two records which match Rebecca's, um, your knowledge about Rebecca, and they're the two highlighted in red. And notice that already from this, from this side information, you can infer that your neighbor either is HIV or has colitis, and she might reasonably already consider that to be a violation of her privacy alone. Now again, in a, in a real da large database and in a real application of these methods, um, you might go for a criterion like what's called k-anonymity. So what's k-anonymity? K-anonymity basically asks that you do enough of this coarsening and redaction so that any row of the remaining in the, in the you know, kind of um, an allegedly anonymized database matches at least k, other, there are at least k matches to that row, k identical records, okay? So then you wouldn't know, um, you know, rather than knowing this is like a two anonymous database, but in general we might, you know, hope to get more privacy by asking for 100 anonymity rather than two anonymity. The real problem, of course, comes when you, know, you also know that your neighbor Rebecca happened to also have a visit to a second hospital whose database is at the bottom. And this hospital has also, in an effort to provide some kind of privacy, done some redaction, the same kind of redaction and coarsening in their database. And now three records match Rebecca there. Um, and of course, the real problem here is the join of these two databases, right, which is sometimes called linkage analysis or triangulation or various other names. When I take the intersection of the top red records and the bottom red records, I uniquely now know that Rebecca is HIV. And you might try to wish these problems away with fancier definitions or by appealing to scale. But, but the real problem with these types of definitions is that they pretend that the data set in front of you is the only data that is ever going to exist now or forever in the world. And they don't anticipate attacks on privacy that come from you know, triangulation of multiple databases, other information you might have about people, even publicly declared information that they weren't particularly trying to hide. Um, many of you might have seen the sort of mainstream news frenzy over articles that I think surprised probably very few people in this room. You know, one was about a month ago, and it basically said, you know, here are 18 apparently innocuous attributes that if I know them about you, they serve as a fingerprint for you among all US citizens, right? So, you know, I'm not sure what they were, but you can imagine if you tell me what kind of car you drive, you tell me your zip code, you tell me what color your eyes are, you tell me whether you have dogs or cats, each one of these things, of course, is like, you know, exponentially cutting away the remaining possibilities, and it doesn't take long to kind of have that sort of innocuous information undo the privacy promises of these uh, anonymity methods. Okay, so these are bad privacy definitions as we discuss in the book. Um, what would be a good privacy definition? Well, let me start by proposing a definition which has been, I think, proposed since at least the 70s. Um, which, if you could get it, would be a nice definition, but we argue in the book that it's basically asking for too much in the sense that if you enforce this kind of privacy, we will never be able to do useful, interesting things with data, um, including things like medical research studies. Okay, so, um, so what is the definition I have in mind? So imagine, you know, and you can make this mathematical, but I won't bother here. Um, imagine we basically said the definition is that no harm should ever come to you of any kind for, as the result of a data analysis in which your data was included, okay? So let's think about that as a privacy definition for a second. So certainly, it's a strong privacy guarantee, right? I'm sort of allowing the notion of harm to be entirely general, and I'm basically saying if your data was used, no harm should come to you of that study. Okay, so why is this asking for too much? So imagine that it's 1950, and you are a smoker, okay? 
Um, and if it's 1950, you are a smoker because in 1950, pretty much everybody smokes. There is no social or medical stigma associated with smoking. In fact, it's seen as a glamorous habit. Um, and so you do it openly in public. Everybody that knows you knows that you're a smoker. Maybe even your health insurer knows that you're a smoker. Who cares, okay? And suppose you're asked to contribute your medical record to the famous series of studies that were done in the 1950s in, in England that firmly established a correlation or connection between smoking and lung cancer, okay? So your data was included in this analysis. This analysis announced to the world that there is a connection between smoking and lung cancer. And now we can say real harm has come to you as a result of this study, right? Now, you know, everybody's posterior beliefs about the likelihood that you have cancer go up in light of this study, and your data was part of this study, okay? And in particular, real harms might come to you of the financial variety. Your health insurer might decide to double your premiums, for example, okay? Now, the key observation, okay, so, so in particular, if we adopt this definition, this study would have been disallowed, right? This would have been a, a violation of privacy, of the privacy of everybody whose data was included in this study. The key observation, though, here is that, of course, um, it's not the case that your particular medical record was the crucial piece of data that allowed this, the link between smoking and lung cancer to be established, right? Any sufficiently large collection of medical records would have been enough to establish this, this fact because you know, the, the fact that smoking and lung cancer are connected is not like a fact about you particular or your data. It is a, you know, what we might call a fact about the world that can be discovered provided we have enough data, okay? So this brings us to the, what we claim is the right definition of privacy, which is differential privacy, which slightly refines the definition I give to sort of account for this fact that your data wasn't the crucial missing piece in this analysis. And this is a schematic, but in English, what does differential privacy ask? It basically asks you to consider two alternative worlds, one in which an analysis is done and your data is included in that analysis, and let's say that there are n medical records total in the analysis. And the other one is the same analysis is done, but on n minus one medical records where the missing one is yours. So what we want is that you know, the, the, the difference, you know, the harm that comes to you is basically identical in these two situations. So whatever, whatever your definition of harm is, whatever it is you're worried about, um, you know, the, the chances that that harm comes to you in the case where your medical record is included compared to the one where it's only your medical record that's excluded is sort of controllably close, okay? And um, as many people in this audience know, the definition of differential privacy involves, it's a property of an algorithm, for, first of all, not about a data, particular data set. An algorithm either is or is not differentially private. And general, differential privacy is generally achieved by adding noise to computations. So you, have, you move from deterministic to randomized algorithms, and you typically add noise in a way that kind of obscures the contribution of any individual piece of data in the analysis while preserving broad statistics, okay? Um, and, you know, so the first time, Aaron's been working in differential privacy much longer than I have, and I remember the first time I saw the definition of it, I thought like, well, that's a great definition, but I'm still worried that it's too strong, right? It's got many universal quantifiers in it, right? It's got a, the algorithm has to, to provide differential privacy on absolutely any input database. The definition of harm can be anything you want it to be, and still the increase in harm as a result of including your data is controlled. Um, and so I, my first reaction was like, you know, maybe you still won't be able to do anything with this definition either. Luckily, that's turned out to be, you know, far from the truth. And in particular, pretty much any technique you know from st statistics or modern machine learning um, has a variant. It is not differentially private in its original form, but it has a variant which gives differential privacy. So, you know, for example, back propagation in neural networks or stochastic gradient descent have differentially private variants. So differential privacy has kind of, you know, just in recent years started to make it out of the lab or maybe, you know, kind of more precisely off the whiteboard into practice. And um, the big moonshot for differential privacy is coming up next year when the U.S. Census has decided that eb every single report or statistic it results based on the raw underlying census data will be released under the constraint of differential privacy. And this is a huge engineering effort, um, and it'll be interesting to see how it turns out.
And I'm going to turn it over to Aaron now to talk about fairness a bit. Yeah, so we're not, we're not there yet on fairness. Um, so we sort of assert that if you, you know, think about differential privacy for a while, you know, read chapter one in the book, that many of you will, will agree that at least for a particular kind of privacy, statistical privacy in data sets, it's somehow the right definition. It's capturing what you want. There's, there's nothing like that in the fairness literature yet. There's you know, dozens of definitions of what we might mean by fairness. And for each one, uh, you know, I could tell you one uh, reason why it, it's you know, lacking. It's not capturing everything you want. In fact, we even know the study of fairness is going to be more complicated than the study of privacy because there are already known you know, different uh, reasonable definitions of fairness that in isolation you would nod your head and agree, you know, yes, that's something I would like, that are known to be incompatible with one another. Nevertheless, um, and so, so maybe you, you think about, you know, the study of fairness in machine learning as, as where the study of privacy was 15 years ago. Nevertheless, it's, a, it's a, an extremely important problem. Uh, here on the slide are, are two headlines just from the last week, uh, two applications that have attracted New York State regulatory scrutiny. One, uh, the, the lending application, the Apple credit card um, that you might have heard about. There's uh, a number of tweets from prominent, prominent people alleging that uh, the algorithm that determines what your credit limit will be um, exhibits gender bias. The other article was about a a widely deployed algorithm targeting healthcare interventions that seems to exhibit racial bias. So I, I don't want to talk too much about definitions of unfairness because I don't think we've yet hit upon exactly the right ones. But I do want to give some um, idea for why machine learning might be unfair in the first place. Because I think a lot of people's first reaction is that, well, you know, bias is a bias of the sort that we talk about when we, when we talk about like racism or sexism. This is some um, human property and we're removing it just by removing human beings from the decision making pipeline and, you know, using objective optimization procedures. And it's a little more complicated than that. Here's a little cartoon to, to illustrate why. Okay, so suppose that Michael and I volunteer to help out with Penn admissions and we're going to design a, a machine learning algorithm to uh, help admit students to Penn. Okay, so maybe in this cartoon, uh, we've got two observations about each applicant, their SAT score and their GPA, and there's some concrete thing we're trying to predict. Okay, so maybe, for example, we're trying to predict whether students, if admitted, will graduate in at most five years with at least a 3.5 GPA. Maybe we're trying to predict whether within 30 years of graduating they'll donate at least $10 million. Right, whatever it is, some concrete thing such that we're trying to admit the people who we've labeled as plus and, and we want to reject the people we've labeled as minus. And there's all sorts of problems you might imagine gathering this data. You might imagine that there's you know, potentially the biases of you know, past admissions officers embedded in this data. But let's wish that all away and imagine for this cartoon example that the data really is what it says it is. Okay, because I want to I wanna show you that it, things can be a little bit more complicated, even in the best case when you've got good data. So there's going to be two populations. You're looking at the green population now, and there's a couple of things I want you to notice about them. So first, Slightly fewer than half of the green population is qualified for college, by which I mean there's slightly more minus signs on this slide than there are plus signs. Second, there's a, a pretty good, although not perfect, decision rule. There's a line I can draw through space, and by and large, although not exclusively, the positive points lie above the line and the negative points lie below the line. Okay, so that was the green population. Here's the orange population. And again, a couple of things I'd like you to notice about them. Maybe the first one you notice is that the orange population is a minority, by which I mean literally just that there are fewer orange points. Okay, like in this context, all it means to be a minority is that there's fewer of them. The second thing you might notice is that the points seem to be drawn from a different distribution. In particular, they're, they're shifted downwards on this plot. They seem to systematically have lower SAT scores. That could be for one of any number of reasons. For example, maybe the green points come from a wealthy population. They take SAT tutoring classes. They take the SAT three times and report only the highest score. The orange points take it once cold. That naturally results in a higher distribution on SAT scores for the green population, but it doesn't necessarily make them more qualified for college. In fact, when you look at the labels, when you look at the actual thing that we're trying to predict, it's the orange population that's better here. And the orange population is better in two ways. First, on average, they're more qualified for college, right? There's 
you know, half of them are positive examples here compared to fewer than half for the green population. And second, it's easy, e even easier to tell who is who. There's now a linear decision rule that I can implement that makes no mistakes at all. Okay, we've got two populations, and in this example, the minority population is the better one. When I say they're better, I mean they're more qualified on average, and it's easier to determine who are the qualified ones. And yet, here are the two populations together. And remember, we're only giving the algorithm SAT score and GPA. So you can see the colors of the points, but the algorithm cannot. And suppose what we ask for is the, the standard, the standard uh, objective in machine learning. We would like to find the model, in this case, the linear decision rule, that makes as few mistakes as possible. Okay? What could be more objective than that? To minimize the number of mistakes. And what you get is just the rule that best fits the green population. You can think about why that is, right? If I were to shift that decision boundary downwards, I would make fewer mistakes on the orange population, but I would make more mistakes on the green population. And that wouldn't be worth it from the point of view of minimizing overall error because there are more green points. And so mistakes on the green population count more for overall error. Okay, So we had an example here where the orange population was better than the green population, but drawn from a slightly different distribution. And when I asked to find the model that minimized overall error, it ended up rejecting every single member of the orange population, despite the fact that they were more qualified and despite the fact that they actually had more signal in their features. Note, by the way, that were I allowed to use group membership, color in this case, in my model, for example, if I were allowed to build a decision tree that said, well, for green points, use the blue line. For, for orange points, use the purple line. Then I could have improved things. I could have improved things for everybody. right? Uh, I would have had a more accurate model. It wouldn't have changed the decisions for the green population. And all of a sudden, I'd be making the right decisions for the orange population. And so two things I want you to learn from this cartoon. The first is that if you just blindly optimize for error, okay, that will tend to fit the major majority population, typically at the expense of the minority population, not for any kind of you know, uh, underlying, not, not, not because there's any kind of like underlying like racism baked into the like objective function, but simply because larger populations contribute more to overall error. And second, although it's a knee-jerk reaction to say, okay, like if I don't want like racial or gender bias in my algorithm, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use those features. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, this is an example where using those features can actually make things better, not just for fairness, whatever that is, we haven't defined it, but for um, accuracy as well. This is an example of something that intuitively seems unfair. Okay, we have this better population, and we've learned a model that nevertheless rejects all of them simply because there's fewer of them. If we want to design algorithms that correct this, we have to pick a definition. We have to specify what we mean by unfair. I don't want to dwell too much on definitions, but for example, in this, you know, in this application, you might decide that the people who are being harmed by the mistakes made by, by our algorithm are the qualified applicants, the positive examples, who are mistakenly rejected by our algorithm. These are the, these are the people who, like it's really too bad that our algorithm rejected them. They, they would have done well had they, had they come to our college. And maybe the thing that you object to in this model is that the rate at which the algorithm is doing harm in these two populations, in this case, the rate of false rejections, the false negative rate, is drastically different between these two populations. It's 100% on the orange population. It's close to zero on the green population. And so you could imagine asking, and this has become a popular thing to ask for, that our, we, we should find a model that comes close to equalizing these false rejection rates. Maybe it exactly equalizes them, or maybe it equalizes them up to you know, 5% or 10% or 50%. So you've got some quantitative notion of unfairness that you can ask for. There's a knob that you can turn, trading off this notion of unfairness with, with other things you care about, like error. And what you find when you start designing algorithms that achieve these goals, and, and you've got this knob that you can tune. And by the way, differential privacy also comes with such a knob. And so you can draw similar pictures when, when you're thinking about privacy. What you find is that um, although there are inevitably trade-offs that you have to grapple with, you can illuminate what those trade-offs are. Okay, so these are 
uh, Pareto frontiers. These are on different data sets for a real machine learning task, um, the optimal rate of unfairness that you can achieve here measured by the difference between false negative rates between populations. That's what's plotted on the y-axis with the optimal rate of error you can achieve. That's what's plotted on the x-axis. Okay, so for a particular class of models, you can achieve an error unfairness trade-off represented as any point on this Pareto frontier, and it is not possible to go beyond, to, to get a model that simultaneously improves on both of these metrics. And what you can see, you know, if you're lucky, like in the, in the plot on the left, uh, you can sometimes get a dramatic decrease in this unfairness metric, in this case, difference between false negative rates at the beginning at only a very small cost to error. Okay, that's, that's what happens when this curve looks very steep. Of course, these trade-offs become more severe as you, as, you start, as you start asking for more and more stringent conditions. And so, as we describe in the book, you know, the science can only take you so far. Right, it, can, it can elucidate what these trade-offs are, but it can't tell you where on this trade-off curve you want to live you know, as a society in a particular application. And there's not going to be universal answers. Right? We'll want to prioritize fairness or privacy more in certain applications. We'll want to prioritize accuracy, other things more in other applications. But you know, there's no avoiding that we have to make hard decisions. And, and what the science can do is it can, it can help us make those decisions with our eyes open. What we've described so far, <clears throat> plus with the introduction, gets us to about the halfway point of the book. And in the mid, mid, midway through the book, we kind of take a wide left turn that we think is interesting and well-motivated. And I just want to give you a teaser for what that wide left turn is. So in the different scenarios and applications we've talked about so far, it was fair to a first approximation to think about individual people, consumers, as the victims of algorithms. So, you know, you might be denied admission to a college you wanted to go to unfairly, or you might have your privacy leaked by, you know, a data set or a computation, and you might not even know it, right? And you might not also know that your data was being used to build these models that are being applied to decisions made about other people. There are other situations in which, um, there's an algorithm, or maybe more precisely an app, and there's a large base of users of that app, and it's not so easy to entirely blame the algorithm alone for the antisocial behavior um, that it exhibits, because that antisocial behavior is sort of a function of the algorithm, but also of the incentives of the users um, who are using the app, okay? And this takes us into the realm of game theory, um, and so in particular, there are many, many apps these days that we can really think about as, you know, the word that's often used is personalization, but the, we might think about the game theory term as being computing your best response, right? So one concrete example is commuting using um, apps like Waze and Google Maps, where in response to real-time traffic, mainly the, the activity of all the other drivers on the roads, there's this app that computes your best response. It basically says, this is the shortest, the lowest latency or the shortest driving route to, for you to take from your point A to your point B. And you might think like, oh, well, what can be better than that? I've got this thing that uses real-time traffic information right now and tells me which, way, which route to drive. But it is driving us all collectively towards a selfish equilibrium of some very, very large, complicated multiplayer game, like literally the Nash equilibrium of that game. And any of you that have had any basic game theory know that just because something is an equilibrium doesn't mean it's a good thing for you or necessarily for any of the players in that game. And so in particular, in the case of driving apps, right, and there's well-known both toy examples and evidence that this happens in the real world, even though we're individually optimizing all the times with these apps, we might be collectively driving more because we're in this competitive equilibrium. And in the book, we, we kind of you know, take this you know, semi-metaphor and apply it to areas that I think are less clearly mathematically formula, formulatable as a game as commuting, including things like product recommendation on services like Amazon or what you see in your Facebook news feed and talk about sort of the tensions between individual optimization and self-interest versus the collective equilibrium that we're at, let's say, in the form of filter bubbles or vulnerability to fake news in the case of, of, of Facebook, things like that. And then the final chapter of the book before we get to the, the catch-all chapter that discusses everything from sort of interpretability to every AI alarmist's uh, favorite dystopia, the singularity, 
um, we, we talk about specifically um, sort of this, the sport, the competitive sport that machine learning has come, become. And in particular, we talk about sort of game theoretic ways of thinking about that and the consequences that it has for things like the reproducibility crisis in the sciences. So, you know, in a very quick nutshell, you know, I think many people in this room will be familiar with the fact that machine learning in some sense has become a competitive sport where there are these benchmark data sets. It's very, there's, there's selection bias in the reporting of results because um, journals won't publish negative findings for the most part. And we really, there's so many people in the field right now um, that we really have no idea how many experiments are actually being run and how to correct for the complexity and number of those experiments to make sure that we're not sort of going down the road that um, you know, food science has already gone down where some significant fraction of the published results are, are not reproducible and, and, and are kind of false discoveries. Um, so that's a teaser for the second half of the book and we wanted to um, invite Emily back up and, and chat with us. So I really wanted to start with um, one of the major theses in your in your work is that uh, the solutions to the ethical concerns that are arising from this prevalence of algorithmic decision making systems um, should themselves be in large part algorithmic. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to this perspective, if your thinking on this matter has evolved at all in the past few years. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we came to that perspective um, through our technical research work, right? So, I mean, we were relatively early adopters of sort of the whole fate um, view of, of machine learning and algorithms like many people in this room. And so we, we knew, you know, even while we were reading reports of our field violating bas basic social norms that we and others were thinking about, oh, well, you know, you could wait for better laws and regulations or you could, you could go fix that problem in the code this way like right now. I, I definitely think our view has evolved and even the draft of the book evolved as we, you know, we've been, we, we, talked, we talked to many people outside of the, you know, computer science machine learning community who care about these issues like regulators, like policy makers, like people who work in social agencies that see firsthand the damages caused by, you know, criminal sentencing models that have gender or racial bias in them, for example. And I think it's the main, the main evolution it had, at least on the book, is to, to, you know, is to point out that we don't think that algorithms can solve every problem um, and that there's still a great deal of room and importance for laws, regulations, and more traditional um, uh, you know, solutions. And that also there are some problems that, the, you know, the really hard problems remain are kind of social. So, you know, if it's the case that um, your police on the street are racially biased in who they decide to arrest or stop and frisk, that's going to kind of show up in the data. You may not know it. And the only solution for it is to like, you know, make police less racist, right? And that's like not an algorithmic problem. It's not even an, uh, an easy regulatory or policy problem. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that, um, so of course, like all of these problems are um, complicated and the fact that, you know, and, and their solutions are probably, you know, can't be derived from just thinking about some very narrowly scoped uh, algorithm without thinking about the sort of broader social and algorithmic mm -hmm. ecosystem in which in which they live. But many of the issues that have come to light when, when thinking about, for example, algorithmic fairness, like trade-offs between different reasonable notions of fairness, um, ha, you know, it's not that they're specific to algorithmic decision making. Uh, they've only come to light now because there's no avoiding when you're using algorithms. Mm -hmm making quantitative measurements and specifying precisely what you want. But, but these issues are, you know, these, these trade-offs, for example, are fundamental to any like decision-making process. They, they apply also to human decision-makers. And so um, I think many people think of like algorithm as a scary word. Of course, you know, like as computer scientists and as folks at Google, we probably uh, think of it as less scary. But, but it's not that, it's not that there are, it's not that you're, just as you know, simple tweaks to algorithms can't fix complicated problems. Saying get rid of algorithms like also doesn't also isn't a workable solution. Doesn't fix anything. 
Something else that you talk about in the book is how the a lot of these outcomes um, are the results of uh, professional scientists and engineers very carefully and rigorously applying principled machine learning methodology um, just to massive complex data sets. Um, and, and so you do kind of get at this a little bit about how what is, you know, the things that are missing in this, in this standard sort of methodology. And so I'm really thinking that like this, this points to how many different aspects of the kind of rigorous scientific practice that we would strive for actually fall outside the kind of standard machine learning um, sort of framing uh, and educational training. Um, and so, you know, for example, uh, one of the examples that you gave um, just now on the screen was this uh, algorithmic healthcare system um, that was sort of reproducing racial biases in the, in the healthcare sector. Um, and if I recall correctly, um, one of the problems with that system was this kind of equating of healthcare with healthcare costs. And so this is something that's been discussed a little bit in the algorithmic fairness community, this kind of um, you know, failure to really precisely articulate and justify uh, the kind of you know, operationalization of, of abstract sort of social constructs into precise variables that are then predicted by the machine learning system. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, the sort of new machine learning education uh, and, and practices that would kind of, um, you know, get at these things that fall slightly outside the kind of traditional machine learning thinking, but are still kind of in this algorithmic frame. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways it's fair to um, characterize, you know, the fairness and privacy chapters of our book, at least, as, as kind of a tutorial um, on, you know, what you can do to make things better without leaving the field of machine learning and going and becoming a social worker, okay, right? And, and by the way, you know, in writing this book, we often would talk to people that would basically say to us, like, well, if you really want to help, you should, like, quit your day job and, you know, go become a social worker. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. But, but I mean, so, but, but I think that maybe one of our points, especially to an audience like this, is that there are things that we can do that are just adjacent to what we're doing already. I mean, the hard part will be, you know, things like the Pareto curves that Aaron showed. There will be hard trade-offs between, you know, um, error and fairness or, you know, error and privacy. Um, but it's not like a, it's not like a different kind of beast. And I mean, if I had to, you know, phrase it very dryly, it's like the difference between solving the optimization problem that you're solving now to solving a constrained optimization problem where your objective is the same, but now there's like fairness or privacy constraints. And so I think, you know, in many ways for the machine learning community, this is like low hanging fruit. It's low hanging fruit that will result in perhaps difficult decisions with leaders of your business units when you tell them like, oh, this will make our ad placement more fair, but CTR prediction will be this much worse, which translates into this much less profit every year. But at least you sort of put the discussion on scientific grounds, and I think those parts are appropriate to put on scientific grounds. Yeah, I think there's two separate things here. So, so, so the discussion we had um, you know, on the slide was in this idealized world where the data was was clean, it was correct, the labels were were right. And right even there there's something to to do, to learn, but but that's really the scenario in which you're, you know, talking about constrained optimization problems and having to deal with trade offs. In the United Health case, the problem for for those who aren't aware is you know, this model was supposed to predict given a, a patient with, with some collection of symptoms, um, health outcomes so that new uh, interventions could be targeted. Um, but they didn't have outcome data. Instead, they trained on health costs. How much, how much did this patient cost the healthcare system down the line with the thought that patients who are sicker cost more? And the, it's thought the reason for the bias that the model exhibited, right, that, that sort of two similarly sick patients, one of whom was Caucasian, one of whom was, was black, um, yeah, the, the model would tend to suggest more healthcare intervention for the Caucasian patient. Well, the reason was because black patients who were similarly ill tended to cost less, not because their health outcomes were better, but because they had less access to healthcare. So this is something, this is a case where you, you, you don't necessarily have to deal with a 
trade-off in the sense that you were you trained your model on the wrong data. If you were able to go out and get the right data, then it would it might solve this sort of unfairness problem and simultaneously make your algorithm better at predicting the thing you really wanted it to predict. But you know, again, I think this is something that sort of made salient just because people are thinking about, in this case, fairness. But this is like a part of like data science education that that would have been important even if we didn't care about fairness in the sense that you could have made the model, even if you just cared about like overall accuracy, you could have made the model more accurate by training it on the correct data. And you know, it's only because you know, someone wrote an article in science about the unfairness of the model that it was brought to light. Yeah, yeah, I guess kind of what I'm getting at is that there are sort of really rigorous scientific practices in related fields you know, for kind of you know, turning these abstract constructs into measurable variables. And this kind of interdisciplinary um, you know, kind of work, I think, is not really being adopted as much as it should be. And I think could really, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily view it as t entirely separate from the algorithm design. I think it really should be integrated. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm just glad to hear that um, I think it's also important. OK, one more high-level question. So you detailed a lot of different sort of troubling practices um, prevalent within the machine learning community and how um, these sorts of practices, you know, like biases in reporting, um, you know, kind of reliance on a small number of data sets, these types of things, um, you know, these lead both to the reproducibility crisis, but also to a lot of, you know, really sort of ethically questionable, um, you know, design and development of algorithms. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on how the community as a whole can start to shift its practices, um, what types of new incentive structures you'd like to see in place. Obviously, this is not a quick fix. This is a very long-term thing. Um, but I think a lot of us are, are members of this academic community. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how we as a, as a group can kind of shift in a, in a more socially and beneficial and ethically informed direction. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my quick answer would be, you know, we do suggest some technical things in the book, and we talk about, you know, the pre-registration movement and things like that, which I think we view as uh, too restrictive of a solution. Um, but, you know, maybe to answer that question and make a broader social comment, I think it would be good for the field of machine learning to become less like a competitive sport again. Um, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon. And it's, you know, uh, you know it, it's, I think, a byproduct of the tremendous um, empirical successes that areas like deep learning had and the need for these massive data sets and kind of, you know, kind of concentrated focus by a large number of people on them in, a, you know, in, in an intense period of time. And that's all been great. And I don't, you know, I, you know no, no knock whatsoever on the actual advances in, in those technologies, you know, which are large, I think, in vision, speech, and, and NLP. But I think, you know, the, uh, and I'll, I'll use my seniority here to point out that the field of machine learning, you know, it used to be that people were considering many, many different types of learning frameworks, of different learning models. Um, there wasn't this sort of uniformity of data sets to the extent that there is now. Or at least if there were, they were really kind of toy data sets that nobody considered like a serious benchmark for developing and deploying services. You know, it's things like the UC Irvine data set which you went to check your results on, but it wasn't like, okay, on the UC Irvine data set, I've now developed this service that I'm now gonna unleash on a billion users. And I think, you know, the field I'm hoping will organically balance itself back more to an earlier era where there's not this single-minded focus on sort of one framework for learning and a few data sets. And so maybe, you know, maybe things like pre-registration or sort of smarter leaderboards, which we do discuss in the book, you know, maybe that's part of the solution, but maybe part of it is just kind of, you know, a cyclical move back towards a um, kind of a more diverse research landscape in the field. Cool. Do you have a question? Jack Dorsey from Twitter yeah. made the announcement that they're not going to do political ads at all. And uh, machine learning algorithms are being used to target, uh, you know, users uh, with those ads. So algorithmic uh, accountability and fairness is uh, being at questionnaire and you know chiming in with Aaron that there is uh, some bit of uh, you know not all algorithms are bad we are trying to make them better so a player leaving the field kind of you know creates this added pressure on the other uh, players in the field to be uh, really accurate about it briefly I don't have deep thoughts on this particular issue um, I think you know the policy to pull those ads entirely is better than having no policy whatsoever. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sort of convinced that, you know, pulling, 
you know, things that are designated as political ads eradicates kind of the penumbra of, you know, worries that people have around the politicization of social media, right? I mean, you know, like I don't think it directly addresses things like, you know, fake news and, and the like. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's better to have a clear policy than to have no policy at all. And secondly, I do think, you know, it's good for the competitive landscape of the tech industry to have actors that take stands on issues and try to, you know, create internal pressure in the industry to sort of think harder about these issues and, and adopt them. I mean, you know, to give an example, you know, sort of Apple has successfully, you know, you, you can debate whether it's how deserved it is, but Apple has carved out a reputation for greater concern about consumer privacy and was an early adopter of differential privacy. Um, and I think that that does create kind of an environment where there's more internal pressure from the industry rather just than from regulators. Thank you. I was wondering, how much do you think that your book is sort of a snapshot of a current moment in time? So certainly it wouldn't have made sense to have this book published like 10 years ago. And how much do you think it is really something that's an enduring set of problems? And because of the, the, the list of problems we understand less and less, it's really creating an outline and a framework that's going to, to you know, have a significant impact over time. So as we say at the beginning of the book, like this is an emerging science, and you know you might reasonably think that that means it's sort of too early to write such a book, but we think that it's sort of exactly the right time because it's when it's when the ideas are developing that, that somehow the like intellectual process of like thinking about them is most exciting. So I certainly think that, especially as you go down that list, maybe even already you know fairness, which was the second thing in the list, that if you look at what the technical approaches are going to look like, you know, 15, 15 years down the line, they might be quite different from what they look like today. But I think that the basic, the basic premise of what needs to be done and, and that's been sort of successfully carried out from whiteboard to, you know, to product to national scale deployments for privacy uh, is enduring, which is that, you know, what you need to do is you need to think very hard, you know, in a, in a, rigorous, precise way about what you mean when you say you want algorithms to be blah, where blah can represent any, you know, any, any, any word you want where, you know, a human being would, would just know what you meant if you, if you told him you wanted, you know, accountability, fairness, transparency, um, but that is not obvious to an algorithm. And then you have to, after you come up with a plausible definition, and coming up with the definition is the hard part, but when you come up with a plausible definition, you have to think about how to, you, know, you have to think about the scientific problem of how to design models satisfying that definition and think quantitatively about trade-offs because typically these things don't come for free. I think that general methodology is, is going to have to be enduring and, and that even if the specifics of how people are thinking about these things 15 years down the line are gonna be different, they will be thinking about these things. I'm going to throw in the story question really quickly. What skills uh, are there other than computer science um, that are most needed for work on ethical algorithms? What advice do you have for successful interdisciplinary collaborations? Let's see. I mean, if by skill we mean sort of an academic um, or specific technical skill, um, I, I think it's more, I, I think what I would advise most is sort of a willingness and actual interest in talking to people in adjacent fields that think about the same issues, but from a non-technical perspective. So I think we benefited greatly, for instance, in conversations we've had with people at the law school at Penn um, who think hard about fairness and privacy, including in technological settings from a legal perspective, and just kind of understanding their views, and also especially understanding the constraints that come from their world and, you know, and, and in talking to regulators, it's quite revealing to talk to tech regulators and realize the handicaps that they face, right? So they're, it's, you know, these are smart people, but these are smart people kind of with many, many shackles on what they can and can't do that really kind of force them to lag in many ways the companies that they're regulating. And so I think it's important to, in working in this area, even if it doesn't like, oh, you know, you talk to some regulator and then you like got a research idea that you then, you know, go work on, um, to just kind of understand that landscape more than any other particular field outside of CS or machine learning. One thing that I've uh, seemed to notice uh, is that uh, when people notice that, say, um, an algorithm is uh, maybe not fair, then uh, what 
um, algorithm designers, um, and even society as, um, at large, tend to do is to come up uh, to think of uh, quick solutions on how to fix it when the solution itself may not inherently be fair. Uh, to take an example, for instance, the uh, the college selection uh, slides that you've showed where you had two populations and to clearly uh, the initial solution of having a general cutoff was a problem, but uh, like you also suggested, one thing that could have been done is consider the two uh, populations um, separately, which seems like an okay thing to do. People might uh, even agree with it. Uh, but then when you look at the data, you do see that even in the green population, there may be uh, some data points which are positives, but they fall within the cutoff range of maybe population two. Uh, and I do think that this happens a lot in real life too, that you know the easy solution is to maybe just say that one very easily observable variable is population type, uh, but m maybe the actual uh, hidden variable that you need to consider is maybe like you mentioned, maybe the income, you know, maybe you couldn't take SAT three times instead of one. So today what I see is maybe people from the green population, uh, perhaps as a result, uh, if there is somebody who falls below the cutoff, then they're completely uh, uh, sh screwed as well. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm wondering as algorithm designers, what are the things that, uh, are, are there, how, can, how can this problem be solved? Because it seems like we are trying to optimize for maximum efficiency, you have the curve, uh, but then as a result, there might be some fragment of the people that always get left behind, although overall it might be the most optimal. Solution. Yeah, so, so I think you've put your finger on one of the main weaknesses of these statistical notions of fairness, and, and we talk about this a little bit in the book, and it's, it's uh, actually one of the main focuses of our, of our research. Um, so, and by the way, this is why we think of, you know, maybe the fairness in machine learning field as an academic field as you know 15 years behind privacy so, so the claim is not that any of the existing definitions are very good so that I think what you're putting your finger on is when you look at these statistical notions of fairness that say things like well I'd like the false rejection rate to be similar between you know like orange people and green people say well you have to like the first step of even like enunciating that was you had to say, okay, well, there are like these two groups I care about, orange people and green people. And usually it's not so easy. And just because I, you know, guarantee some notion of statistical equality in aggregate over two large groups doesn't mean that the solution that we come up with is fair in various technical senses to you as an individual or even to even to large groups of people that you think of yourself as a member of if they weren't the exact groups that we specified up front. Um, so so there, let me just, without saying too much about it, this is an active area of research. There are things you can do. There are fairness notions that are somewhat more satisfying than these. They don't require enunciating you know, a small number of like pre-specified, coarsely defined groups up front. There are ways to talk about fairness at an individual level, and maybe we can talk a little bit offline. But these are, this, this is sort of the research frontier. Like we don't understand that much about methods that guarantee protections of this sort and their implications. So, so it's a very good question, and I, I'd say like, there's people thinking about it. You should go off and think about it. Like it's not, it, it's not a settled science yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.